Good morning, everyone. We're excited today to start our service with baptism. And before we do that, I'm going to read for you Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. What shall we say then? Are we, co- are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we hide to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin. Once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. We have the blessing of baptism. Baptism is one of two ordinances that the Lord Jesus gave us to um, be involved in, to participate in as a picture of what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus Christ. As we go down in the water, it's a picture of of us dying to ourselves as we are identified with Christ. Jesus died and we died to ourselves. But Jesus was also resurrected and we are identified with his resurrection as well and thus have eternal life forevermore as we follow him. Uh, Jesus said that if you profess me before men, then I'll profess you before my Father in heaven. And this is certainly the, uh, the first picture, the picture of what it looks like to be a professing believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, This morning we have Mr. Rusty Costner coming, professing faith in believer's baptism. Rusty, who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ. Rusty, a profession of faith, and in the divine command of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, and raised to walk in the newness of life. (laughs) Oh, thank you so much. Amen. We celebrate that. And uh, just to make another note, Brother Mike's got to put about three inches more water in in this baptistry. We have fun in the Lord, we have the joy of the Lord, and one of the, um, one of the ways that we see the joy of the Lord is in our children, and uh, maybe the most important ministry of Southern Baptist life over the last, I don't know, 50, 100 years has been Vacation Bible School. It is uh, crucial to the lifeblood of our, our church as we seek to see our children come to faith in Christ as early as possible. If you'll look through the screens, you'll see a video about our upcoming Vacation Bible School. God bless you. G'day mates, welcome to Zoomerang. As we zoom around Australia, we'll discover some amazing animals and sights. More importantly, like a boomerang, we are returning kids to what the Bible says about the value of life. We'll discover how precious each and every one of us is to God, from the tiniest to the oldest. Each person is made in the image of God, wonderfully designed to know Him and to live for Him. Out of His great love, God offers us salvation through His Son, Jesus. Kids will learn that life is valuable. Grab your sunnies, that's your sunglasses, and your mates, those are your friends, and get ready for a fair dinkum time at Zoomerang. Yeah. Man, we're excited about VBS. We hope you are too. If you haven't signed up for that and your kids and kids you know, please do invite your neighbors. Um, 
June 5th, the Sunday night before VBS starts, we'll have a big VBS kickoff like we did last year. We'll have inflatables and hot dogs and snow cones and all free, and so everybody come hang out and be a part of that. Tonight is our last night of Awana. Uh, we're going to have a huge awards night. We're going to celebrate afterwards uh, with ice cream sundaes, and so if you're a part of Awana in any way or a family member of someone who's a part of Awana, please come. There also will be no... Uh, Bradley's class will not meet. We invite you guys to come and cheer on those kids and congratulate them for all the hard work they've done because it's been unbelievable the amount of scripture they've memorized and um, uh, how they've grown. And so we want to celebrate them tonight at five in the gym. Even if you haven't had anything to do with the Wana all year, come cheer them on and fellowship with us uh, over ice cream. Uh, today uh, is the last day to pick up in the in the two lobbies. Uh, in the gym, uh, stuff you could donate for VBS. That stuff needs to be turned back in Tuesday, and so we ask you to do that. That's a big help, even if you can't come serve at VBS. If you can grab one of those two things, uh, one or two of those, and, and bring some snacks, that would be a huge help for us. Um, this week is the last week to sign up for our family kayak trip, and so please do that. And then uh, two more things. I, I've been here as the family pastor at Mount Gilead for, I think, over three years, almost three years, and I've never once come up here and begged for volunteers, but I'm going to do it this once, okay? So everybody listen carefully, and I promise I won't do it again for three years as long as we get some. We really need some one- and two-year-old Sunday school teachers to sign up to start teaching starting August 1st, one- and two-year-old Sunday school teachers is a great need we have that I need to get filled by August 1st. And the other thing is we have had a ton of students sign up for Wired, and we are so excited about that. But if we don't get more female adult chaperones, only us boys will be going, and those girls won't, because we're required to have a five-to-one adult-to-student ratio, and we need a lot more adult females if we're going to be able to do Wired. So please let me know as soon as possible on both of those. And now Tom and Becky Bush are going to come up and talk about some exciting things that the outreach team has going on. Mount Gilead. We are excited to share with you this morning uh, that Mount Gilead will be hosting another Backpack Blessings on Saturday, July 23rd from 10 to 12 in the Family Life Center. Backpack Blessings will be a great outreach ministry and an opportunity for us to reach out to our community, to the children, families, our community schools, as well as our teachers and bus drivers right here in our Mount Gilead family. We'll be providing a brand new backpack, supplies grade appropriate, as well as um, offering some games for the children to play. My very favorite part of Backpack Blessings is we actually pray over the child, the backpack, their family, and their school. Um, as I was preparing to share this with you, God reminded me of Miss Doris Bass. Miss Doris came every time we did backpack blessings, and she shared the Bible story. And that is one of the things that we do. Not only are we giving backpacks and supplies, we're sharing God's word. And... Um, as well as praying over these backpacks and these children. So, um, again, I thought of Miss Doris and Miss Bonnie Palmer. They were two of the ladies that were very helpful in doing this, as well as you, and many of you participated and helped with that. So, um, there's going to be several other dates that we'll need you to help us out. So, go ahead, mark your calendar for July 23rd. But there will be two other dates in July that we'll go out and canvas, just as we did the other time. So um, I'm going to ask you to do three things to help this ministry. 
first pray. We have to pray because we want to seek God for his guidance and his direction on how we minister to these students, families, and the schools in our community. Then we have to plan. So go ahead and mark your calendar. Uh, we'll let you know uh, as soon as we've nailed down the other two dates to Canvas and then prepare. We're going to ask Sunday school classes, as we did before, to co help us collect the supplies. So in your Sunday school class, the first Sunday in June, I don't know that date, <laughs> but you'll get a sheet of the supplies that we're going to ask you to collect. So um, again, just pray. We want to do and um have this ministry the way God wants us to and plan and then we got to prepare. We can't do this without you Mount Gilead and the uh, we were trying to remember how many times we did it before and I couldn't but um, it was very successful the other times that we did it. So thank you. Yeah, and our goal is to give away approximately 250 backpacks. Uh, I can't remember exactly how many we gave away before, but our goal was like 200. So that's what we're looking at now is to somewhere around 250 backpacks that we would like to, to give out to the community or to schools or someone that, that will be in, in need of that. So uh, that's the reason we need your prayer because we would like to reach that goal. Okay, thank you. No one left me. Uh, let's stand together, church. <clears throat> As we begin to worship this morning, I, I hope and pray that you are prepared and pre to worship this morning in spirit and in truth. Why don't you find somebody that you maybe haven't spoke to this morning, maybe somebody that's uh, maybe visiting with us, and greet them in the Lord this morning as we prepare to worship together. Let's lift our voices together. Come thou fount. Come thou fount of every blessing. To my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. And teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming. Lost. I was lost in utter darkness till you came and set me free. And I was bound by all my sin when your love came and set me free. Now my soul can sing a new song. Now my heart. Come thou found, come thou king, come thou precious prince of peace, but hear your prize till we sing, but come thou found of our blessing. Oh, to grace, how great a day, the daily I come. 
Come thou found, come thou found, come thou need, come thou precious Prince of Peace, hear your bride to you we sing, come thou found of our blessing. And I was lost in utter darkness, till you Hope and life and death is Christ. We look to Him this morning. Let's sing together. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence? That our souls to Him belong. Who holds our day? What comes apart from His command, and what will keep us to the end? The love of Christ with which we stand. Oh, sing! Oh, sing! A hallelujah! Our hope. His word. What truth can calm the troubled soul? God is good. God is good. Where is His grace and goodness known? In our great Redeemer's blood, who holds our faith when fears arise, who stands above Sends the waves to bring us nigh, who's to the shore, the rock of Christ. And oh, sing a hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing a hallelujah, now and ever we confess. To the grave, unto the grave, what will we sing? Christ he lives, Christ he lives, and what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with him, there we will rise to meet the Lord, then sin and death. And we will feast in endless 
for us. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Stand sinners flushed beneath that flood. Lose all their guilty stains. Lose
Apostle Paul's epistle to the church in Ephesus, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Paul writes, And you were dead in the trespass, trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and, sa and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them.
Amen. Christ in power resurrected as we will be when he comes. Won't that be a glorious day when we're resurrected ultimately and finally with Christ Jesus? That's where our hope is. That's where uh, the, the basis of our joy lies. Thank you, choir, man, for uh, leading us in such wonderful truth. Our ushers are coming now as we continue in worship. We uh, worship through giving and tithes and offerings and certainly continuing in prayer and praying for other churches that are in our local association and uh, sister churches of whom we love and are on mission with to reach our local Jerusalem with Christ. Uh, this morning, our, our focal church that we're praying for is Calvary Cottonwood, where they have um, called their new pastor, Michael Smith. So we'll be praying for him and uh, praying that uh, the Lord will bless this offering as we use it to uh, bring the good news of the gospel to all those around us right here in Dothan and in the world at large. Pray with me. Gracious Father, we come rejoicing in truth, rejoicing in Christ and his gospel, the good news that our Lord lives, that he reigns, eternally in that we in Christ seated with him in the heavenly places even now and Lord as we behold that that wondrous mystery I don't understand the fullness of what that means but I know it must be awesome and so father we look to you and we cry out with the rest of the, the church and the kingdom to come Lord Jesus come but until then May we be faithful to share the gospel and show the love of Jesus in every direction that we can live our lives. And that shows up as we give. We give our offering this morning. Lord, we pray that our tithes and our offerings would have the blessings of God on them as we give them back to you. As a reflection of, number one, your unbelievably infinite giving spirit to us. And number two that we might be on mission. Father, we pray for uh, all of the local churches in our area, and particularly, particularly now Calvary Cottonwood and Brother Michael Smith as he starts a new ministry there. May your blessing be upon them, the power of the Holy Spirit through them to reach their area for Christ. We glorify you. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.
invite you to take your copy of God's Word. I want you to turn to the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 14. Had a few conversations over the last month or so with some people that uh, made me think it would do us well to spend a couple of weeks thinking about the issue of doubting God, kind of struggling with, with faith. And so I want us to take a look at Numbers chapter 14, and really this entire chapter, but I'm not going to read the entire chapter as we begin. I would like to read for us, however, as we begin verses 26 through 30. So let's stand to honor the reading of God's Word. I'm going to read from the English Standard Version of the Bible. Uh, you follow along uh, in the versions that you use. It's just the version that I use. And following this, I'm going to get on my knees and ask blessing over His Word. I invite you to join me as the Lord enables you. We're in the book of Numbers. Numbers 14, verses 26. I want us to read verses 26 through 30. The Word of God says, And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, and to Aaron, saying, How long shall this wicked congregation grumble against me? I have heard the grumblings of the people of Israel, which they grumble against me. Say to them, As I live, declares the Lord, what you have said in my hearing, I will do to you. Your dead bodies shall fall in the wilderness. And all of your number, listed in the census from 20 years old and upward, who have grumbled against me, not one shall come into the land where I swore that I would make you dwell, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Pray with me. Gracious Father, we desperately want to be a faithful people in a land of such faithlessness. And Lord, we know this land is hard, these lives are hard, and we cling to you. But if we're quite, quite honest, God, we don't always understand what you're doing. And you find us grumbling, you find us faithless, or struggling in faith. So, Father, I pray today that you would use your word to build our faith, to encourage our faith, and to help us look to our King, who is in control of all things and who cares for your people. I pray, Father, your Holy Spirit would prepare our hearts to hear your word and prepare me to preach in a way that brings glory to your name. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. You ever had some plans that didn't quite turn out exactly like you thought they would? When I was 13 years old, I was in the Boy Scouts of America. I've told some stories about being in scouting over the, over the years. Uh, this particular year, they were having a world jamboree in Australia. And I wanted to go to Australia to go to this jamboree. I had a friend that was going, and I could just, we talked about going together. The problem is, oh, this was back in the uh, 19... 1980s, mid-1980s, and my parents didn't have the $2,000 it was going to cost to take me to, to Australia, so I started thinking, I need to find a way to make some money, and so in my mind, I had this, I had this brilliant idea. I'd go down to the local nursery, and I did this, and I bought two little seedling pear trees, and I planted them. And I thought to myself, these trees are going to grow up, and they're going to produce a harvest of peaches. Did I say it? Peaches? Peach trees. A harvest of peaches, and I'm going to sell these, and I'm going to make my $2,000 to go to Australia. Now, mind you, the jamboree was in eight months. It took two years for those trees to produce the very first peach that was about that big. A couple of years later, my parents, uh, we were, that story came up, and we said, yeah, Bradley, we knew that didn't, wasn't going to work, but we just didn't want to discourage you. The 
We've had some friends like that, haven't we? People we've known who have had some great ideas of how they were going to change their life. I'm going to start selling beauty products, make all the money in the world. And we think to ourselves, yeah, that's not going to work. Or nowadays, it's, uh, we're going to follow a YouTube guru. Oh, yeah, he's got all the plans. I'm going to follow his system. We'll follow his ways. And, man, my life is going to change forever. What do you think? Yeah, that's not going to work. Have you known anybody who said, you know what, I'm going to leave this podunk town I grew up in, and I'm going to, I'm going to move far away. I'm going to move to Alaska, and I'm going to start a new life for myself. And six months later, they're right back in this podunk town. We think to ourselves, yeah, I knew that wasn't going to work. Doubted their plans from the very beginning. But let me ask you this. Let me ask you this question. How many of you have ever doubted God's plans for you? Particularly as his plans started to, to play out. And we know, look, God has plans for us. There's no doubt about that. We, we look to the scripture. God has a plan for, for all things. We are mindful of that uh, very famous verse, Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you or to give you welfare and not for evil, to give you future and a hope. And this was in a time where the, the, the people of God were under discipline in Babylon. And God says, I still have plans for you. And we want God's plans for us. And we want God to be at the wheel. And we want all the blessings that come with God being at the wheel of our lives. That blessing of fulfilled life and purpose in life and peace and hope. But as God starts leading our lives and driving our, our, the car of our lives, so to speak, Somewhere along the way, you start kind of wondering whether God knows where he's going. Because, well, you know the end point that God promises. You know where God promises to lead you to. But have you ever in the process turned and looked at God and said, God, if I were you, I wouldn't have taken this route to get there. I would have gone a another way. Maybe someone says, God, I, I never planned on being single my entire life. I wouldn't have gone that way if I were you. Or God, I didn't plan on having a handicapped child. I wouldn't have taken this route. Or God, this illness that's in my, in my home and my parents require a tremendous amount of care or in my children. I, I wouldn't have gone that route. Or God, this, this job that, that you put me in that I thought was a great opportunity and, and now it's just not what I thought it would be. I wouldn't have taken that route. It's just crazy, God. You're driving all over the road. Move over. You're driving like a drunk. Let me take the wheel. You ever feel like God's driving like a drunk man? Taking all over the place. Places you'd never take yourself. And so we, we tend to say, God, let me take the wheel. I'm making the decisions from now on. I'm deciding where we're going. You sit right here in the passenger seat. Well, I imagine we all at some point have questioned the route God was taking us in his plan. We're not the only people that have ever done that, not even close. All through the scripture we see people who are, have serious doubts about what God's doing or what he's about to do. Think about Joseph. Joseph's brothers threw him, threw him in a well and sold him into slavery. And scripture says that he later said, you meant it for evil, but, but God meant it for good. God was a part of that. Moses, <clears throat> who was called to go and deliver the people of God, the Hebrews, out of Egyptian captivity and, and bring them into the promised land. You remember that whole discussion? God's like, Moses, you're going, you're going to be the deliverer. And Moses is like, no, 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 not, not me. I'm not your guy, God. And I don't speak well. I stutter. Man, I'm not, I'm not that guy. And uh, God's like, oh, no, you can take your brother, but you, you're going. The story we're going to look at today is the, the same. It's the story of the, the Hebrews really doubting God's plan as God used Moses to lead out of Egypt into the promised land. So the Hebrews had been in Egyptian captivity for, well, they'd been in Egypt for over 400 years. 
and uh, now they were in captivity for quite some time. God had told Moses, go and deliver my people, the land that I have prepared, the promised land. When he got there, it didn't happen as easy as he hoped it would. Pharaoh didn't want to let them go. And so God worked, and God worked in a mighty way. Uh, he brought ten plagues on the land, and then he led the people uh, with a fire by no- a day and a cloud by night. He, uh, he did these mighty works of parting the Red Sea and save- saving them from the Egyptian army. And uh, as they were making their way to the promised land, you know what the people were doing? They were grumbling. They were complaining. They were fussing the whole time. God's there doing miracles left and right, delivering them, and they're complaining. What do we have to eat, God? Manna. Manna. Get up, manna. Next day, manna. Third day, manna. 90th day, manna. And they're complaining and throwing a fit about it. What do you want? We want quail. Oh, you want quail? I give you quail until it's coming out of your nostrils, God says to me and as they complain they start thinking to themselves we're just gonna we're gonna die this is, this is awful they, they get to the they get to the you know the whole deal about water and I won't go into all of it but they finally get to the promised land God, God brings them there God told them to go take it they decided to form a committee they go look at the land and they, they come back and 10 of the 12 uh, spies that were on that committee said, well, we can't take it. There's giants in that land. They'll destroy us. And the people, they just complained and grumbled all the more. They, they said to themselves, it would have been better if God had just left us in Egypt because at least in Egypt we were fed. I mean, we could have just died in the desert rather to go into the, this, quote, promised land and be taken as plunder by these giants. Look at verse 4, Numbers 14. It says, and they said to one another, let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Now, this is that moment where the Hebrews said, God, you're driving like a drunk man. We're taking the wheel. We're getting our own leader. We're going our own way. God, we don't want you to drive anymore. We doubt your plan. Well, needless to say, God is not pleased when his people doubt his plan. Because what it ultimately is, is a lack of faith. It's a lack of belief. It's a a lack of trust in God. Look at how God responds to this in verse 11. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will this people despise me? How long will they not believe in me? In spite of all the signs, miraculous food, spreading, uh, uh, dividing the Red Sea, uh, just giving water from a rock, all these signs that I've done among them. In other words, what exactly do I have to do to get this faithless people to trust me? And then the rest of this passage as it unfolds is, is detailing the cost of, to the people for not trusting God. What does it cost the people for not trusting God? Say, we choose a new leader, we go to our own way. What does it cost us when we doubt God's plan, when we say, God, you're driving like a drunk man, get out of the ditch, I'm driving from now on? It costs a lot. First of all, I think the Bible says that it costs us God's best. Go back and look at verse 20 through 23 here. Look what it says it costs the people. Look how God responds. It says, verse 20 and following, Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word, but truly as I live and as all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and yet have put me to the test these ten times, and have not obeyed my voice, shall see the land that I swore to give them, or to give to their fathers. None of them who despise me shall see it. 
I said, that's fine. You don't have to follow me, but you're not going to see my blessing if you don't. And they didn't. All men 20 years old and, and, and older, they had to wait it out. And so he sent them back into the desert. He sent them back into, um, you know, the, what was the promised land? The promised land was God's intended best for, this, for his people. And all that they had experienced, all of God's miracles, all of those plagues, all of his power on, on display, the point was is to get them into the land that he had promised them. And after this long journey of months in the desert, all of this complaining, all of this God's work to get them there. And they're finally there. And then they hear the two most devastating words that maybe could be spoken to them at this point. Turn back. Look at verse 25. Now, since the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwell in the valleys... In other words, because the giants are in the valleys that you're so afraid of. You think those giants are bigger than me. All right. Turn tomorrow and set out for the wilderness by the way to the Red Sea. In other words, turn back around, go back into the wilderness, the direction that you came. Here they are after this long journey promised land and they got to turn back and go home but we're here God we've made it I don't care turn around I won't tolerate this faithlessness I was trying to think of a <laughs> some analogy that would um, capture the heart of this moment I can't think of a, a great one but here's here's one that comes to mind any parents ever driven your children to Disney World? Any parents ever made it all the way to Disney World and your children still be alive? I mean, that's a tough trip. And I can remember even as a child, and we were driving from Mississippi, my parents drove us uh, one year uh, to, to Disney World, take us to it for a family vacation trip. And I just, you just remember this trip, it's just out hours on end in the car and most of the time what are you doing you're just fighting with your brothers and sisters especially back then we didn't have ipads and iphones and different you're watching netflix on the way you know what what, what did y'all do parents what did you do when you were in the car having to take a long trip if y'all not gonna believe this we used to like count license plates and look and see which states that we could, could find and see if we could get all 50 states we would to count like the number of red cars we passed it was the most awful way to travel and then we just fight with you. I mean, you just fight with your, your siblings, your brothers and sisters. You just imagine this bigger and fighter. You can fight and dad's yelling, would y'all be quiet? Y'all hush. And mama's complaining because dad's complaining. Dad's complaining because mama's complaining. And then you got to stop and get gas. You stop and get gas. And he asks, now y'all go ahead and use the bathroom because, you know, you don't want to have to stop again. Oh, I don't need to go right now. And then 20 minutes down the road, you need to go. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, it's bad. It's hard. It's a tough trip. It's miserable. But finally make it, finally make it to Disney World. And, oh, it's good. You drive through that, uh, that overhang bank. Welcome to Disney World. Oh, it's all right. And you're here and you pull up and you park in the parking lot. You park in Pluto, you know. It is, it's just, man, it's, it's fantastic. Get on that tram and go. And you, uh, it's, it's, it, you take the monorail and you take the monorail or the ferry and you choose the monorail because, I mean, it's the monorail. And you get on that thing and you ride in and, man, you, and as you come in, you can see it all. You can see Cinderella's castle. You can see, um, what else can you, 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 you can see Epcot, the big dome coming in. Man, you're excited. You can smell the magic in the air. You get there, and you're at the gate. And over on the left side, you can see uh, Mickey and Minnie, and they're taking pictures. And then here's Cinderella, and they're, they're starting to put together a, a, a little... Um, a little activity for kids and stuff. And man, you can smell the candy from Goofy Candy Company. You know what I'm talking about right there on Main Street. And you're about to get in to these tickets. And man, you are excited. And then dad stops and looks at you and says, Y'all are the worst kids I have ever had. Forget it, we're going home. Turn around and take the other. Why 
would be awful. And that's not exactly what these, the Hebrews are experiencing here. But it's just what comes to mind. As they are told, turn back. Go back the direction that you came. It cost us God's best and what God, the blessings that God wants to give us. Not only does it cost us God's best, because they go back into the wilderness to die. They're going to die. What are we doing here? what's, What's your plan, God, back here in the wilderness? My plan is for you to die so I can take your children in to the promise I was going to give you. Not a great plan, God. Don't care. Faithlessness. It costs us God's best. Not only does it cost us God's best, but it costs our children God's best as well when we don't trust Him. Look at verse 33. It says, it says And your children shall be shepherds in the wilderness forty years and shall suffer for your faithlessness until the last of your dead bodies lies in the wilderness. Like I said, God had said that every person that was 20 years and older, that obviously they are the ones who had experienced as adults God's power and miracles in Egypt and then the miracles on the way to the promised land. They would die in the desert. Now picture this from the children's perspective. Where were they supposed to be while they are suffering in the desert? They're supposed to be in the promised land. They're supposed to be enjoying the promises that God had promised their parents. But now, because their parents wouldn't trust God, they had to spend the next 40 years wandering around the desert waiting for their parents to die. Can you imagine some of those conversations with teenagers? Why don't you just die? I mean, what response do the parents really have? Yeah, that's what we're waiting for, isn't it? Forty years of their children's lives wasted because their parents couldn't trust God. When parents decide that they cannot trust God, they not only waste their lives, but they waste a large portion of their children's lives as well. When you decide, you know what, I, I, we, we, we're not going to be a giving family, a tithing family, but not only do you not step in faith and live under the blessing of that God has promised over families who live as, as givers. But you've also taught your children a lifestyle that is guaranteed not to have God's full blessing on it. Or when you decide that the woman God gave you in your youth or the man God gave you in your youth isn't enough anymore and so you run off to, to someone else chasing some adventure in the moment. Not only do you destroy your life, but what do you teach your children? What do they learn about the values of long-term commitment and loyalty and unconditional love? Oh, those are just words. You've almost guaranteed that they're going to struggle with their marriage as well. Until somewhere along the way, somebody else has to come along and undo the values that you've passed down to your children. And give them godly values. Thank the Lord for godly Sunday school teachers. Thank the Lord for godly coaches. Godly teachers at school. Thank the Lord for um, others that God has blessed and equipped to speak truth and love into our children's lives. Thank the Lord for godly vacation Bible school teachers. Thank the Lord for for that. Would you go back over? Your past, I want you just to think for a moment, how much of your life have you wasted not trusting God? I mean, maybe it was because you had parents who passed down a pattern of not trusting God. Maybe it was that led to some decisions that weren't that good and some places that you're right now. For whatever reason, 
What decisions have you made that you clearly know were decisions where you did not trust God and it led you back into a wilderness out of the very blessing that God wanted you to have? How much time did you waste? How much benefit did you give up? Was it a, that job that you shouldn't have taken? But it promised glitz and glamour and all of a sudden, and you know, this is not what God wants me to do. But now you've been in that job for years and you're like, I, I, don't, I don't know how to respond to this. Or maybe you dated that girl or that guy that you knew wasn't right for you, wasn't in God's will. And now that thing's falling apart in relationships and you've wasted years of your life. Or maybe in a, even in a marriage that, that fell apart because of that very same thing. How much time have you wasted because you did not take the steps to trust God because you didn't trust Him to take you the path that you wanted to go? I've got friends that ran from a call of ministry to ministry when they were young and now 45, 50 years old going back to seminary to prepare for a, the next stage of life so they can do what they should have been doing all along. I mean, have you ever been on a mission trip? Like your first mission trip and you were you 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 didn't know about going, you're a little anticipate, you know, a little worried about going and had a little anxiety, but then you went and, and you're like, that was so great. That was so awesome. I got so blessed. I cannot believe that I'm 45, 50, 55 years old, and this is the first one of my I've taken. How how much joy have I missed serving the Lord because I wasn't ready? To trust God. I got good news for you today. That starting today, starting right now, you don't have to live one more day outside of God's promised land. Not one more day. Because the promised land is the place of faith. First of all, it's the place of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for us. It is trusting in Christ and trusting in His power to redeem us from sin and to give us life eternal, just as you saw in the baptistry with Rusty Costner just a few minutes ago. That visual that I've died to self and I am trusting with Christ and I am now walking in the newness of life. That's the first place that that starts. But even as believers, and believers here, you well know that even as you are trusting Christ with your soul, there comes some times along the way where you're not necessarily willing quite yet to trust God with this issue that's going on in your life. Missy and I faced infertility for, for years, struggling, wanting to know what was going to happen, wanting children desperately. We didn't know God was going to give us three children. If we had, we wouldn't worry. I grabbed that will often from God. God slapped me around and grabbed it back. We don't have to spend our lives outside the promised land. We just have to trust Him today to lead us. What would it look like for you right now to say, God, you take the lead? What would you need to give up? What would need to change in your life? Because you can take that step in the promised land right now, but it means that you've got to take a step of faith, and probably a step of faith that you've been putting off for a very long time. It means trusting God and not doubting God. It means, God, I know that you know better than I do. Here's the will. Take me wherever you want me to go. Let's bow our heads. Gracious Father, Lord, we come to you in a lot of ways, as just like the Hebrews were, grumbling and complaining because you weren't taking them in the way that you wanted, that they wanted you to take them not trusting in what you were providing and the difficulty that that life was bringing because of the leadership that you were giving. But you had blessing for them in the future. You had blessing from them even in the moment. But Lord, they lost faith. God, I pray that we wouldn't be a people who, lost, who lose faith. Lord, I pray that 
that we would not give up your best for us because we don't trust you in this moment for every single decision in our lives. Forgive us for that. Father, forgive us for the impact that our faithlessness has on our children and the long-term impact that that has on where they end up in their lives and the way they look to you for hope and trust and faith and life. Father, I pray that we might be parents that our children know to trust the Lord, and to love the Lord, and cling to the Lord, so that they might live lives that cling to you as well. Father, I pray for those here who just quite honestly feel like they've been in the wilderness for a long time. Oh, sure, they may be believers on the Lord Jesus Christ in terms of their, their eternal life. They may certainly have that locked in, but just they st- are struggling daily with decisions that need to be your decisions. And you've even made it clear what you want for them, but they're just not so sure that they can follow that direction. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen their faith today. Father, I pray that you would show them that the giant that God is, that is much bigger than the giants right now that they are afraid of in the land. Father, show your power, show your strength, show your love. And so I'll ask you one more time, what does it look like for you to take that first step into the promised land? What do you need to give up? What needs to change? Is it a relationship that you need to lay down and say, God, this is not of you, I'm going to lay it down? Maybe it's a, a job. Maybe it's in a certain educational direction. Maybe it's that you've been fighting a call to ministry and you know this is where God wants you. What do you need to give up? What do you need to change? What conversations do you need to have with your spouse so that your life and your home is a home that's built on the rock of Jesus Christ? And where do you find yourself desperate? That you would just cry out to God and say, God, I've had the will for far too long. Come and take it for me, from me. I need you. Father, we need you. For those that don't know Christ as their Savior and Lord, they need you for salvation and eternal life right now. And if that's you, I, I just encourage you now, turn to the Lord and cry out to Him. Say, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner, and I need a Savior, and I believe that Jesus can save me right now. I feel your Holy Spirit. I feel His strength on on my life, and I I turn. I yield. You take the will. I die to self. Would you come give me life? What about you right now? know that you have salvation, but you're just struggling with life in this day. Cry out to the Lord, take a pity. I'm desperate, God, take a pity. I fought you long enough, God, take the Lord. I don't want to spend the rest of my life in this desert. I don't want to waste the life that you've given me. I don't want to impact my children's lives in a way that they don't trust Christ. Come, I give my faith to you. I follow you wherever you lead. You take the will of my life. In just a moment, we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. We're going to make these steps a place to do business with God. If you just need to come and you just need to pray and say, God, I'm, I'm yielding this thing to you, whatever it is. You don't have to tell anybody. No one knows. It's you and God. You just might need to do business right here. Put a stake ground and say today I step into this land of faith I'll be here I'd love to pray for you if you'd like to be a pastor pray for you let's do business with God stop doubting him and trust our king and trust where he leads Father we trust you now as we respond in Jesus name Would you stand? I once was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew 
the way with the sin that promised joy and life wouldn't let me to the grave I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will and if you had not loved me first I would refuse you still but as I read my hellbound praise indifferent to the cross you looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross and I beheld God's love displayed you suffered in my place you bore the wrath reserved for me now all I know is grace hallelujah Stay with me. She comes down, and she comes trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ for her Savior, to be her Savior and Lord, professing faith in Christ this morning. Amen. And we celebrate that, and she'll be following up in believer's baptism. She'll get some uh, what we call conversion counseling and walking through the gospel and help her understand what baptism is and the steps that she's making today. But uh, if you celebrate... Her willing to say, God, you take the will of my life. I'm trusting in Christ. Let's just celebrate again. Give the Lord a hand. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. In just a moment, I'm going to allow our church to come down and welcome you into uh, the family of God. And so just hang out just, just for a second, all right? I also want to invite uh, Rusty and Vicki Costner to come now. Rusty uh, was uh, baptized just this, you're all fine, just this morning, like to drown him, getting him all the way down there, that was, uh, <laughs> was great, but uh, Rusty today is, is coming, uh, seeking membership in, in Mount Gilead, as now that he's followed in believer's baptism, I've had a chance to talk with both he and Miss Vicki for uh, a, a number of times, both strong believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, and so uh, he is coming by profession of faith on, for membership in Mount Gilead, and uh, she is coming on transfer of letter from Newport, Tennessee, right? New, they tell me the name of the church again. Northport, Nor, dear Jesus, Northport Baptist Church in Newport, Tennessee. All right, 
Very good. And so if you affirm their decision to follow the Lord uh, this way as membership of Mount Gilead, would you let it be known by saying amen? amen. Give the Lord a hand. Give the Lord a hand for sure. I'm going to ask, if you would, for all of you to remain here. I'm going to ask our church family to come and to congratulate them and to welcome them uh, into Mount Gilead, okay? All right. Uh, let's see. I believe Kenneth, too, is supposed to be closing us out with prayer. Brother Kenneth is over there. Very good. So he's going to come, Brother Kenneth. Uh, you close us with prayer, and as uh, he does, I'll just remind you that you're not dismissed, but you are sent. We have the gospel of Jesus Christ. We really can change the world. God bless you. Let us pray. Our Father, we come to you today, Lord. We just we come to you as sinners, Lord. We we doubt your plan in our lives, and Lord, we just pray that you just you just change that about us, Lord. That um, that you'll open our hearts and our minds, and that we can receive your blessings that you want us to have. And um, Lord, we just trust that you'll just that we can help you. That we can. Open our minds to, so we can fulfill your plan, Lord, that what you have got for us and we could um, just open our hearts and our minds, Lord, that, that you know what's best, and Lord, that you just, just be in our lives and everything that we do. And Lord, I just pray that you just be with us to go throughout this week, Lord, that, um, that you just guide us. And Lord, we just thank you for this church body and the fellowship we have here. And Lord, we thank you for the ones that have come this morning. Lord, just bless each one of them. Lord, we love you and we praise your name. In your name we pray, amen.